Ingolar Aronson sees the coast of the island and drops his pillars, the totems that mark him as a chieftain, into the water. Wherever they wash up, he decides, will be his home. Let Thor choose the place. Three years later, the party finds the pillars washed up in a rocky bay. Steam from volcanic springs masks the shore. He christens the place Smoky Bay after its volcanic steam. And so, Ingolor made his home in a place called Reykjavik. Medieval Scandinavians were talented boat builders, sailors, and warriors. Navigation, however, let's just say it wasn't their strongest suit. Oh, they could chart a basic path via the stars and signs, of course, but they tended to stick within sight of the shore and island hop when they had the option. In bad conditions, Viking navigation was more dead reckoning than anything. And sometimes that led to embarrassment. Like when one party of Vikings cruised the Mediterranean bragging how they'd sacked the mighty city of Rome, only to find out they'd gotten lost and attacked a smaller city instead. <laughs> I'd be so embarrassed. But at other times, those mistakes led to discoveries, as it was with Iceland. The Norwegian who discovered it had in fact aimed at the Faroe Islands and missed. He glimpsed the glacial interior and named it Snowland. A second accidental explorer reached the coast in a storm and circumvented it, proving that the new territory was an island. Neither knew that Irish monks had lived there decades before. Finally, someone got there on purpose, a man named Floki, who'd heard stories from the first two men. He sailed northwest from the Faroe Islands, locating the island by the somewhat dubious method of releasing ravens in different directions and heading towards the one that didn't come back. Still. He got there, even though it won him the derisive nickname Raven Floki. He found the summers pleasant and green, but decided to pack up after the first long, dark winter. Raven Floki returned with stories of a harsh land, difficult to settle, riven by glaciers and volcanoes. He named it Iceland. But there was one very attractive thing about Iceland. It was free, and in more ways than one. Land was becoming hard to get back home a fact that may have driven the Viking expansion as a whole. And rising kings like Harold Fairhair were building a centralized state, cracking down on the freewheeling frontier spirit of the Scandinavian homelands. Iceland offered a tempting solution to those who were tired of scratching out a living on shrinking plots of land, those who had been caught up in blood feuds, those with authority problems. Misfits, who didn't fit into Scandinavian society or were too wild for their homelands. And as an added bonus, this island was uninhabited. After all, not everyone who wanted land was willing to stab Anglo-Saxon warriors to death for it. That was dangerous. Here there were farms for the taking, with no armed opposition. So when Ingolor settled at Reykjavik, he set off a land scramble. And not everyone who settled there was what you'd expect. For example, the sagas tell us of Oath the Deep-Minded, widow of the famous Dublin ruler Olaf the White. When both her husband and son were killed, the story goes Oath ordered a canar built and loaded her remaining family and retainers into it. She personally captained the ship to Iceland, claiming a bay in the northwest and heading the community there. When she died, she was given a ship burial, an honor usually reserved for men. Indeed, the Icelandic sagas are full of tales where women, some of them Irish or English slaves, run settlements, and serve as influential members in settler families. And the archaeological records appear to bear this out, with a large number of women from the British Isles among Icelandic burials, sometimes with high-status grave goods. And let's talk about those sagas for a moment, because it's from Iceland where we get the greatest collection of Scandinavian sagas. Whether it was due to the long winters giving time to write, the wide availability of parchment from cattle raising, or the need to develop community identity in a land without traditional political divisions, medieval Iceland experienced a literary explosion. And since there was no central authority serving as a patron or censor, there were no limits on what could be put down. The works included family histories, settlement narratives, stories of war, and Scandinavian religious myths. These tales were transmitted orally until the 13th century, when people started to write them down in the form we know today as one of Iceland's greatest cultural treasures. 
And the uniquely decentralized society that allowed this literary revolution also had a decentralized form of government. After all, these misfits and independents had fled to Iceland to get away from lords like Harold Fairhair. So after 930, this Icelandic commonwealth, also known as the Icelandic Free State, operated on a system similar to village legal assemblies back in Norway. The chieftains would gather together a representative assembly called an Althing, a type of early parliament that settled disputes and made or amended laws. Uniquely, the legal code was not written and depended on an office holder called the law speaker, who could recite the code from beginning to end. Trials would involve parties bringing a lawsuit, which were then judged by members of the assembly forming a jury. Later versions even had a national assembly and an early Supreme Court. And in the year 1000, the Althing addressed what would be its most momentous decision. Christian missionaries had nearly completed Europe's conversion, and as one of the few pagan lands left, Iceland was under pressure from trade partners to convert. But that was only half the issue. Many Icelanders were now Christian as well, and it seemed like a civil war was brewing. So the Althing gathered and chose one chieftain, himself a pagan, to mediate the dispute. Would Iceland convert or stay pagan? After mulling it over for a day and night, he gave his decision. Iceland would be Christian. But... Pagans could practice their beliefs in private without fear. The Althing was not a perfect system. Gradually, a few powerful families became entrenched in power, bending or breaking institutions as it suited them. Centuries later, these conditions led to what the Althing feared, a civil war, though it was a political one, not religious, that eventually left the island under Norse control. But despite how it would end, this relatively equitable, self-governing commonwealth did govern itself for nearly two centuries at a time when most of Western Europe lived under kings and princes. But Iceland wasn't for everyone. Eric the Red arrived at the age of 10 when his father was banished from Norway after a killing. Violence must have run in the family because in 982, Eric quarreled with his neighbor and ended up killing a man. The family brought a lawsuit, and the Althing banished him from Iceland for three years. So he relocated to an island off England, but he almost immediately got into an argument with his new neighbor and ended up killing a few more men. Clearly, that wasn't going to work out, so he had to find somewhere new to settle, preferably somewhere with even fewer laws and no neighbors. And that's when Eric remembered stories he'd heard about a man who'd blown off course and sighted a new land northwest of Iceland. Another Norwegian had tried to settle there, but given up, speaking of it as harsh and empty. Sounded like Eric's kind of place. He packed up his family and went there, rounding the southern tip of the island and cruising up its western side. Eric found a land locked in ice. The kind of place Iceland would be like if it didn't have the warmer Atlantic currents or volcanic activity to moderate the chill. And Iceland was already tough. Only those who worked hard raised enough to eat. But this land was tougher. If he wanted to survive here, he'd need more colonists than just his family. Only a community could support human life. In other words, you guessed it, he'd need some neighbors. And he saw opportunity here. Iceland was getting overcrowded, its small areas of cultivated land unable to support the swelling population. So three years later, Eric arrived back in Iceland to recruit more colonists. Ever persuasive, he spun tales of the lush new land he'd discovered to the west, where there were farms for the taking and men could truly live free. And like any shady real estate developer, he gave it a name that, while maybe not completely accurate, rang with the sound of prosperity. He called it Greenland. <laughs>